welcome back to Books with Brandywine. Today I wanted to talk about Shakespeare Gardens. What is a Shakespeare Garden, you might ask? Well, it's exactly as it sounds. It is a garden that includes any of the flora, plants, herbs, flowers that are mentioned in any of Shakespeare's books and or his plays and his sonnets. So far, they've totaled about 175 different types of plants that are mentioned in his various plays and his sonnets. And the Shakespeare garden can include all of those or any select of those, depending on the theme of your garden. So in, interest in Shakespeare gardens started around the early 1900s, late 1800s. They started writing books about it. The first one that I was able to find, the oldest one, is Flowers from Stratford-on-Avon by Paul Gerard, 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 written in 1852. And then there were a couple books in the early 1900s, such as Shakespeare's Garden by J. Harvey Bloom in 1903, which can I just say, I love it when people's names match whatever their occupation is. He's writing about flowers and his last name is Bloom. Anyway. Uh, and then there was Flowers from Shakespeare's Garden, written by Walter Kane in 1906, and The Flora and Fauna, the, no, The Flora and Folklore of Shakespeare by F.G. Savage in 1923. And those are just some of the books. Like, I'm sure there have been way more books than that written on the subject of the flora that is in Shakespeare's books, or in his plays. Because it, it's kind of an interesting subject. Some of them were just trying to name and identify each of the flowers. Some of them were trying to figure out, like, the themes behind them. And like I said, there are 175 different flora and fauna that are brought up. There's the obvious one, roses, as in the line from Romeo and Juliet, a rose without, with any other name. And they're also mentioned in Henry VI, uh, because it is, and Richard III and Henry VIII because it is the War of the Roses is going on, and so, like, one side's wearing white roses, one side's wearing red roses, and at the end, they combine under the Tudor, which is a red and white rose. So, roses everywhere. There's also that part in Hamlet, when Ophelia is starting to go mad, and she is handing flowers out to everyone, and she actually lists a combination of flowers and herbs. I had to write them down. Uh, she lists rosemary, pansies, fennel, columbines, rue, daisies, and violets. So there's like a lot just right there. And that they're like interspersed throughout the place. Um, the, I love fennel. I like to eat it. Another cool feature of Shakespeare Gardens, in addition to having the flora that are mentioned in the sonnets, is that some of them also have plaques with the quotations from each play where that plant took place. There are also, like, for instance, the Arboretum that is at Anne Hathaway's house in England, not the actress, uh, Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway. Uh, in the Arboretum, you can sit on the benches and listen to Shakespeare's quotes from his different plays over the speakers. There are, uh, some gardens have busts of Shakespeare, like, you know, the head bust of them, and so... A lot of the gardens, in addition to having the flora from the plays, also try to incorporate actual, like, Shakespeare stuff so that you get a more enriching experience, which is really, really cool. <laughs> and just as interest in the flowers started having books be written about it, people actually planting Shakespeare gardens started to become popular in the early 1900s. So 1916 was the 300th anniversary of Shakespeare, and that was a year that was huge for Shakespeare Gardens, especially in the United States. Three huge Shakespeare Gardens popped up in that year. One in Illinois, one at Central Park, and another one in Cleveland, Ohio. And each of these are still huge Shakespeare libraries that you can go and visit today. They each had really elaborate ceremonies when they were being set up. Uh, the one particularly in Ohio has, uh, like, pieces from actual Shakespeare locations, like, um, the, the, they were sent roses from the tomb of Juliet in Verona. They were, I believe the Cleveland, Ohio one also has the, a graft of the mulberry tree that's from New Place in Shepherd on Avon. I know for sure the one in Illinois and Central Park, their mulberry tree 
was grafted from the, the mulberry tree that was planted 300 years earlier by Shakespeare in his home. And so they not only are they flowers and fl uh, from the plays, but they are also actually have ties to Shakespeare and Shakespeare locations, which I think is way cooler. These Shakespeare gardens are all over the place. There are many of them in the United States. They are in England. I saw some in South Africa. And then I kind of stopped looking at the list because it was a really long list and I didn't read every single location, but I know that they're in various places around the world. Uh, they are in public places. They are also in people's personal gardens because each of us can plant our own Shakespeare garden in our yard because it doesn't have to include all 175 of the flora and fauna. I keep wanting to say flora and fauna of the flora that are in the plays and sonnets, we can have it in our own little gardens. The reason I found out about Shakespeare Gardens is because the Huntington Library has a Shakespeare Garden. And when I was taking AP Art History in, I think it was like my junior or senior year of high school, we had to do a report on a piece of artwork or a garden from the Huntington Library. And I chose to do my report on the Shakespeare Garden. I got to do like a nice report of all these really pretty pictures because the garden is gorgeous and have like all these quotations from Shakespeare saying when like the different flowers were mentioned and I loved it. After we finished all of our reports, we all got to go on a huge field trip to the Huntington Library and I actually got to see the Shakespeare Garden in person. I haven't actually seen a Shakespeare Garden since then, so it's probably been like 12 or 13 years-ish, not to age myself, but I'm gorgeous. Anyway, and so like I want to visit Shakespeare Gardens and I kind of want to have some of the Shakespeare Gardens in, or Shumpfus Flora in my yard. Mint is very invasive. And so is, I think they mentioned like lemon balm. So if you do end up making a Shakespeare Garden, make sure you really research what the plants are, their different environments, so that you don't have mint taking over your entire yard. But I really would encourage everyone to look up Shakespeare Gardens. I'm going to post a bunch of links underneath of some really cool articles that I found about them. And there's just, it's so cool to think that he had so many different flowers mentioned. They don't think that he was an actual gardener, but they do believe that he had some gardening experience, either from growing up in a small village that had lots of gardens or just in life, because he mentions so many different plants accurately. And he mentions even the care of plants, pruning and whatnot. So it's apparently flowers are a huge part of Shakespeare's place. So I will see you guys tomorrow. I have today and then two days left. So I'm going to be doing my uh, magical readathon wrap up. And if I end up reading the two gentlemen of Verona, then I will try and do a video on that. But I haven't, I don't know yet how, I'm, if I'm going to get to that. So we will see, but I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Have a great Shakespeare month. <laughs>